Hi, I'm Carolyn Kellogg with the Los Angeles Times, and I'm privileged to be here with Tom Parada, who, in addition to uh, writing the books, which were made into movies, Election, and Little Children, is the editor of Best American Short Stories 2012, and we're going to talk to him about uh, great short fiction. Hi, Tom. Hi, Carolyn. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, you write in the introduction to Best American about how your own literary taste informed some of the choices that you made when it came to selecting the 20 stories in the, in the book. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I can tell you how I think about my tastes and how they developed. And, and then I actually question how much those tastes influenced my choices here. But, but the way that I defined my literary identity and aesthetic to myself um, goes back to Raymond Carver and, and the moment when I discovered him uh, in my early 20s and uh, right before I went to graduate school. And, and I was, I talked about this sort of crisis that I had. Um, I was a working class kid and then I had gone to the Ivy League and I think I was holding in my head, you know, two different ideas about who my audience was as a writer and who anybody's audience was as a writer and um, I, I was you know trying to figure out am I writing for the people I went to college with am I writing for the people I grew up with and I read Carver who was very much a, a working class writer in those days and he was writing in this sort of simple or deceptively simple form you know, using very common uh, colloquial language and telling you know, anecdotal stories often said in places like diners and uh, shops and, and fishing trips. And uh, it, it just was really electrifying for me to discover Carver. And, and that opened the door onto a whole um, literary moment that was just bursting into flower. And, and it really was defined by Carver, uh, who was teaching at Syracuse University. And so I went to Syracuse for uh, graduate school. And I went there to study with him, but I, never, I didn't get the chance. He retired and then, um, you know, tragically died uh, young uh, soon after that. But Tobias Wolf was also teaching there, and he was very much associated with, with Carver and with um, this aesthetic moment that people now call minimalism. I know that Tobias Wolf doesn't like that term, and a lot of, a lot of people don't. But it involved people like Richard Ford, um, Bobby Ann Mason, Amy Hempel, there's there was a whole bunch of writers and it was a sort of a blue collar, um, plain language, no nonsense aesthetic movement and it really uh, shaped me and very much in comparison to, um, it was sort of sandwiched between two maximalist eras, one being the Pynchon, Barth, DeLillo, sort of 1970s maximalism and then uh, the maximalism of my generation, postmodernism, uh, you know, mainly defined by David Foster Wallace, Rick Moody, and a bunch of other writers. So I, I was really seeing myself in that dialectic between um, minimalism and maximalism, realism and postmodernism, uh, plain language versus stylistic virtuosity, all, all those different ways that you can describe that. And this is a, you know, an aesthetic division that goes way back in, in American literature. Uh, I mean, you can, you can say Hemingway and Faulkner, and you might even go farther back if, if, if you chose to. But I think it's something that, uh, you know, I, I fall on one particular side, maybe a more populist or democratic side of uh, that literary debate. And, yeah. Well, let, I was going to ask you a question. You said that uh, you, you um, found yourself in this dialectic and then you questioned um, sort of how that dialectic came about. When you talk about the history of the um, like American working class voice versus stylism, like high style, um, weren't there some writers like Whitman who combined those two things, like the working class voice with stylistic virtuosity? And isn't that sort of a happy medium? Yes, it, yes it is. And, and in fact, I, I the reason I was wary of going all the way back was that I was suddenly thinking about someone like Melville and how he, and Whitman, you know, I think maybe at that moment, um, because I think people were very clear that the literary audience was a highly educated audience, um, that, that there wasn't that division. I think Whitman was celebrating the working man 
and maybe moving towards something else. But I think his audience was was a very educated one. It was it was the poetry audience. On the other hand, you see, you look at someone like Emily Dickinson. Um, there's a sort of deliberate simplicity that I think is really really been one of the hallmarks of American literature. Um, I would think of Stephen Crane, Willa Cather, even Edith Wharton versus Henry James. Say, I, you know, I'd fall on the Wharton uh, side of, of that divide. But I, I agree with you that there are definitely writers who have um, managed to it, just ignore this this division and any division that you sort of impose on a huge body of work like American literature um, is going to make sense for certain writers and, and uh, less sense for others. All I'm saying was that that was the framework in my mind. That's That's been the thing that I've believed about myself and my aesthetic ever since uh, I was starting as a writer. And so um, uh, that's uh, looking back these stories are all contemporary and um, some of them are from writers who are just breaking into um, sort of the literary consciousness. Um, when you were looking at the stories and making your choices, um, did you see the names on the stories? Were you just reading text? No, did you no, know where I, they came from? I did, um, partly just because it's, uh, it's a huge job for Houghton Mifflin and Heidi Pittler, who's the series editor, to uh, gather up all these stories. And basically what they're doing is taking them from journals and just photocopying them and sending them to me. Um, and so, just for instance, if a story came from the New Yorker, even if you covered up the name and covered up the fact that it came from the New Yorker, um, I would know from the way it looked on the page that, that it came from the New Yorker. And chances are I might have read the story in the New Yorker since I read, I don't read every everything that appears in the New Yorker, but I read a lot of it. So already you're talking about, and, and there's someone like George Saunders whose voice is so unmistakable that even if you covered his name, I'd say, oh, there's George Saunders. I mean, there are definitely those writers. And if, there was just, if it was just plain text, you'd be like, yes, this is the Alice Monroe short story I read in the New Yorker a month ago. You know, it's a small, two small town girls from Canada hoping, you're going to the university hoping that, um, they can reinvent themselves as sort of uh, sophisticated, urban, modern women. You know, that's just, it's the poor Alice Munro story. There's, there's no hiding it. So, um, so people like um, George Saunders and Alice Munro, who are included, um, are among the best short fiction writers working today. Um, who were some of the new writers that you discovered when you were reading for this that made the cut? Oh yeah, well that that is the uh, really exciting thing about about this collection, and, and I think the re one of the great roles that it plays in American literary culture is that it does really introduce um, people who have published in very small magazines and often for the first time to uh, you know a, a, a pretty wide audience. And um, just the the really odd event that happened with this book was that two of the stories that I picked uh, came from a magazine called Hobart, which comes out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, that I had never even heard of. And uh, the story is Navigators by Mike McGinnis, which is a really interesting story about a father and son who become obsessed with a video game. And, and uh, really kind of a heartbreaking story about um, that moment when you sort of see your parent for the flawed human being they, that they really are, rather than um, the hero that you want them to be. Uh, and then uh, Roxane Gay's story, North Country, which is about um, uh, the black woman professor uh, in the, you know, incredibly rural uh, college in northern Michigan and, and the love affair that she gets into. So those are, those are two of the stories uh, by new writers that, that really struck me. And um, what was it about those stories? Um, and Hobart is great. Aaron is, you know, he works totally independently. It's not even like a university literary journal. Um, but was it the language? Was it the content? Was did you look for a surprise when you were reading? You know, this was this was, I think, the thing that I learned uh, in the course of doing this was that you know I have this idea of who I am as a writer, and, and you'd think that then I would want to see that reflected back to me when I'm reading. But but in fact. It turned out not to matter that much. I mean, if you look at 
just on the one hand Saunders and Monroe, they're just they're very different writers for, for me, and I, I, I love them both. Um, with the McGinnis story, I think I had that feeling that one sometimes has as a middle-aged person, which is, you know, I don't I didn't grow up playing video games, but my son grew up playing video games, and he's obsessed, and I and I've been thinking like that's that's his rock and roll, that's this world that he's completely familiar with, that just really I don't know what's going on in his mind. I don't really understand the magic of, of entering that. And I thought the story Navigators really was the first uh, piece of fiction that I'd seen that put the experience of video game obsession um, right into the right into the story. The story is about that, but then it's also about um, a relationship between the father and the son. So I, there I really was thinking, what a great story. Um, it uh, it does something new and it does something familiar and emotional that I want from stories. Um, the Roxanne Gay story also felt like I had never seen a story uh, about this particular situation, which is the loneliness of you know a black woman professor. She's in an all male department. She's in an all white, completely unfamiliar part of the country, and she falls in love with a, a man who um, seems to her like the last man she would ever fall in love with. So in those cases, I think they're they're beautifully written stories, both of them. But I think I was most struck first by the sense of some new piece of the world being illuminated by this story. And one of the things I love about this book is so much of America can be um, illuminated. It's a big country, and uh, you know I tried to be uh, diverse in all sorts of ways in the selection, and, and uh, was very open to stories that brought me someplace new. Um, and how many stories do you think you looked at when you were going through this process? Well, this is this is the embarrassing confession for the editor, um, the guest editor. Heidi Pittler does so much work. She attempts to be um, a completist. She she basically reads. She said somewhere between three and four thousand pieces of published short fiction for this. Right? I know. I know. It's what she does. And she selected 120 stories. So that's a very small uh, percentage of what she does. And she sent the 120 to me, which I read, and picked my favorite 20. So that's a lot of work, but it's nothing compared to what Heidi did. Um, uh, it seems like with 120 stories, if you read them all at once, that um, you must have started to see some patterns or some trends, like are people writing in a certain way that you saw, like, a, an unusual threads? Yeah, well, this, in my introduction, I, I mentioned this because I was operating under this uh, probably slightly outdated sense of, yeah, American literature is what happens in the polls between Raymond Carver on the one hand and David Foster Wallace on the other hand. But reading this, uh, these stories, um, my sense, particularly when we're talking about the short story, is that the really the writer of the past 20, uh, 25 years or so is Alice Munro. And what she really succeeded in doing was carving out this whole other space. Uh, I think that she's an interesting mix. You know, she's like Carver in her focus on ordinary people and in the unfussiness of her language. Um, but she is a, a maximalist in another sense. She basically doesn't think that there's a fundamental difference between a short story and a novel. Um, she will use multiple points of view. She'll extend over the course of an entire lifetime. I mean, it used to be that a story had a central event, um, and you could say in a single line what a story is about. But I think with the Alice Munro stories, you'd have to say, this is about um, this character's entire life story. Or you can say this is about this constellation of characters and their complex relationships with each other over time, and, and I really think that the success of her work has expanded people's sense of possibility, formal possibility in the story. And so what I was really surprised by was how many stories um, had multiple points of view. Um, within the book, I know that uh, there's Alice Munro's Axis, there's George Saunders' Tenth of December, Edith Perlman's Honeydew is a beautiful 
compressed novels that has three points of view and multiple triangular relationships in it. Um, and I saw that a lot in, in the other stories that, um, some of which, which didn't get included, but, but I, I do think that has been the major formal evolution that, that I've seen. A couple of other just uh, odd notes, and I, and I don't know if it's just a question of the sample that I got from Heidi, but I, I found, um, you know, a, a surprisingly few really sort of sexy stories or, or erotic stories. They must be out there. I, mean, I think it's probably in its own ghetto, but I was, I, I wondered if you, one went back and read from other times, if one would find more of a focus on, uh, you know, on, on that aspect of, of human life. Or yeah. if you jump to 2013 or 2014, if Fifty Shades will have mm -hmm. seeped its way into literature and people will be trying more sexy stuff. That's true. And, and, and I shouldn't say it's not there. I mean, there's a very creepy Mary Gates skill story in here called The Other Place, which um, isn't really about uh, sex, as in the way that most of her stories aren't really about sex. They're as much about uh, violence and alienation. Um, Jennifer Haig's story, Paramore, has a, a little a classic uh, kinky scenario uh, in there, though that's just a, a small episode within a larger narrative. Um, Tai Selassie's uh, The Sex Lives of African Girls is, um, sounds like it's going to be more fun than it is. It really turns out to be um, <laughs> multi-generations of, of sexual abuse um, and really is a kind of a sad and disturbing story. Um, now I know you for your novels, but um, you uh, are you, you also write short fiction. Yeah, well, my first book is a book called Bad Haircut, and that's one of those books. If it were published now, it would be called a novel because they're ten short stories. They're all self-contained stories, but they have the same narrator, and it just follows him from approximately age eight to age eighteen. But because publishers, I think, are a little bit wary of short stories these days, it would it would definitely be called a novel now. But but I that was my first collection of stories. But I will publish next sometime next year uh, my first real just collection of unlinked I mean, just an, a garden variety anthology of short stories. And for you, um, what what makes the difference between a, a piece that is should be a novel and something that is contained as a story. Like it, sometimes reading a short story, I it feels like it could keep stretching out and be a whole book or a whole novel. Yeah, well, that's why I've been so pleased by Alice Munro and and her sense that um, the story can be as big as it needs to be, um, because I, I do have a little novelist um, sense that you know, one story leads to another, that there really isn't a sort of, it's just really hard for me ever to just say, okay, here's the boundaries of my narrative. And particularly, I love to be able to move into the character's past. I haven't been able to do that kind of ruthless uh, focus on the present. I don't think I've ever written a story in present tense, which, you know, doesn't preclude going back in the past, but I, I think, I, I do like the idea of, of having access to the character's past, and I do think that I tend to find meaning in the way people change over time and in the relationship between past and present and the juxtaposition of um, different narrative times. So my stories tend to be long and I think closer to uh, Munro than, than to my heroes uh, like Carver and Wolf. And do you, when you were making selections, uh, were there any stories that were just too big? like? that didn't fit into the definition of a short story? Um, well, Heidi, uh, I probably took some of those out. I think it's really hard for people to publish very long stories. I think magazines uh, usually frown on things that are over 7,500 words, though we did have a couple of, of really long ones. Um, uh, the Sex Lives of African Girls is, I think, the longest story in the book, and it's, it's quite long. Um, but uh, I, I don't remember. I, I think th I think they were sort of pre-selected for proper length. I mean, Heidi probably eliminated stories that uh, pushed the boundaries too much. Well, um, let me ask you uh, two more questions. Your work often includes um, the close-up uh, 
examination of characters who change over time and and the moments in people's lives that aren't you know um, astronauts uh, <laughs> normal people's lives um, but they also include a lot of humor and I wonder were you were you able to find um, are people writing funny is it hard to write funny in short fiction you know it's very interesting because uh, again I think when Heidi talked to me early on I said you know, she says is there anything I should keep an eye out for and, and I said oh I, I really like funny stories and in fact I think she did look for funny stories and send me a bunch and then I think uh, I ended up not responding as well to them as um, the stories that I picked in the book. I mean Saunders story is, is extremely funny. Um, uh, Carol Ann Shaw's story, Last Speaker of the Language, has a lot of uh, wonderful comic moments in it. But I think that what I discovered was that um, what I really love in stories is a moment of unexpected emotion and and that ended up being the thing that um, if I was moved by a story I was really likely to include it uh, so I think I think that I turned out not to be as interested in funny stories as um, you might expect from my own uh, interest in, in comic writing in my own work so um, I understand that once you're guest editor, like you are, you graduate out, and you're never allowed to be guest editor again, right? So far, I, um, I, I, I think everybody gets one shot. So, so I know that 2013 won't be the Tom Parada selection, but if we, um, as readers, wanted to get a head start on what your imaginary best American 2013 would be, what should we be reading? Oh. Like what journals and magazines, where should we look? Well, you know, this this was the other, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, the New Yorker just continues to turn out an amazing bunch. I mean, the usual suspects would include the New Yorker, Tin House, Branta, McSweeney's, the Paris Review, but, but then there, you know, there are the Hobarts, which I'm so glad to have discovered. There are... There's a there's a story in here by Sharon Solwitz from something called the Fifth Wednesday Review, which I never heard of, and it is a uh, just a heartbreaking and, and beautiful story about um, a terminally ill boy skiing with his brother. And I think you know there are just so many good writers and so many venues for short fiction that uh, I think that's one of the things that makes them so important, that they're just gems out there that I think wouldn't reach a wide audience. If, anthology and other anthologies didn't exist. Well, so thank you for joining us. The book that you edited was uh, Best American Short Stories 2012. <laughs> it's very shiny. And, um, and uh, I look forward to your collection of short fiction coming in 2014. Oh, well, thank you so much, Caroline. I really thank, enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us. Okay, this is the LA Times with Tom Parada signing off. <laughs>